M S W Media. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 134 of Clean Up on Aisle 45. It's only taken us 134 weeks to get here. It's Wednesday, August 16th. I'm Allison Gill. Hey, Allison. I'm Pete Struck. Lots of news today. First and foremost, the Fulton County District Attorney's indictment of Donald Trump and so many others, 18 others, the FBI thwarting a Biden assassination attempt and a new FBI whistleblower. Uh, And we also have some motions denied for Pete Navarro in his criminal contempt case and Donald Trump in a Manhattan DA case. But first, let's thank some patrons because, you you know, you make the show go. We couldn't do it without you. We appreciate you so much. So a big thank you to Max Nauda, no relation. Uh, And by the way, last week, Pete, you, you... you didn't mean to imply that there could be any relation. You thought that was a production note. <laughs> I, I did. And Max, huge apologies. I, I saw that and I thought it was something we did internally. I in no way meant to uh, impugn or otherwise imply that there was a relation. So my profound apologies. <laughs> thank you so much for being a patron. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, so anyway, thank you and, and my apologies for last week. <laughs> and thank you to Susan Smutney, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. That's lovely. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, that's WTF, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Uh, Christine Tackner, Gilda Gailey, Nancy Trammell, Bill Hockey, Tony Wilson, Wee Jane, and Carol P.W. Thank you again so much. We have more to thank. We'll do that later in the show. Uh, but uh, Pete, let's start with the events leading up to yesterday, uh, leading up to very late last night, I should say, when we finally got an indictment unsealed, because there was a lot of stuff that went on while we were sort of waiting to see what was going to happen, because most of us weren't expecting this to go down yesterday until we found out that some people got called in early. So basically, it's well, the, the whole day started with Trump posting on Truth Social, uh, intimidating a witness, telling former Lieutenant Governor of Georgia, Jeff Duncan, not to testify, like, like straight up, not even like a wink and a nod, just... He shouldn't. He's going to testify. He shouldn't. Uh, and I thought that that was pretty brazen, given, uh, you know, given the laws down in Atlanta for, uh, you know, being able to be allowed out on bail. Yeah. You know, and I think I've read the Georgia law talking about witness intimidation. And there is some question about when telling somebody don't testify, the, the law is written so that it has to be, you know, some direct inducement or direct threat. And of course, with Trump, the issue is he's you know, nothing. He's like a mob boss, right? He's not going to say, I'm I'm going to hurt you or cause bad things to happen if you testify. That's not the way he operates. And everybody from Michael Cohen has said that. Even, you know, my, my nemesis, Bill Barr, I think has compared him to a, you know, a six or eight year, 12 year old who sits there, well, can't be a 12 year old, but like a glass of water on the table, pushing it closer to the edge to see what you're going to do. That's what's Trump. That's what Trump is doing. So I think it's, you know, a matter of time. I would be shocked If he does not end up with sanctions from some court, given what he said about all these different prosecutors and judges. But yeah, it was clearly the minute a witness is due to go testify the same day to take to social media and your millions and millions of followers and saying, don't go. You know, know, come on. When when the thing you're one of the things you're being investigated for and eventually were in fact charged with is, you know, getting people to to not do their official duty to not, you know, to engage in a corrupt act. So it was, it was brazen. I think it is yet again, Trump having lived a life of not having any consequences 
trying to figure out and push that line because it's worked for him for the past, how the hell only is 78, whatever yeah. years. Well, that and, and he wants to get thrown in jail or gagged because then he can cry about it and be a martyr and claim First Amendment and all this other crap. Um, but, you know, in Georgia, though, the onus is on the defendant during arraignment to prove they have to prove that there is zero risk of witness intimidation or a possible obstruction of justice. And, and that what he posted is going to make it a little harder for him. Uh, but we'll see what the judge ends up doing. Judge McAfee, by the way, I believe is who's been assigned to this. He's a brand new judge, but I think he spent a lot of time as a, a prosecutor. Um, so he's not totally he's not like an Eileen Cannon situation. Uh, but uh, he's not a Trump appointed judge either. Right. And and we'll see. I mean, I think they'll go in. I would be very surprised if he's remanded to custody based on these or other statements. But I th- would fully expect that there'll be some very stern statements about specifically what the conditions of release are. And as you pointed out, Georgia, it's an affirmative, you know, it's presumption of uh, being taken into custody. So I think Trump will be able, and his attorney specifically, will be able to prove or, you know, provide sufficient detail and assurances to get him out on bail. But I would not be surprised if the judge you know, draws a line in the sand about what he's able and not able to do. And clearly, I think the things he has done to date are going to be on the other side uh, of where that line gets drawn. So we'll we'll see what happens. Um, you know, and again, it was interesting yesterday, not only uh, Duncan, but there are a lot of other folks. I mean, you, you, Gabriel Sterling, I think, was there. B. Wynn uh, testified and talked about it. And then I think um, George Cheedy, who is the attorney or uh, journalist who was – um, walked in on a bunch of the fake electors and recorded <laughs> them. He was there, but I don't think I don't think he ended up testifying. If I if I have that correctly, is that right? Yeah, he tweeted uh, that they didn't need him. Right, it was uh, time was getting long, I guess, and um, they didn't need him. I think they got to seven, maybe uh, six or seven of the ten witnesses they intended to bring in. Uh, but he was supposed to come in on Tuesday, not Monday, and he was called in early, as was Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan, former Lieutenant Governor, I should say. They were told to come in Monday. And so they did. So I guess she wanted to get it all done all in one day. And I'm not sure what prompted her to stay, you know, stay until midnight to get this done instead of spreading it out over two days. But something prompted her. Rumors on the ground was was that it might have been that, uh, you know, that truth social post to to try to get Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan not to testify. Uh, but we really honestly don't know the answer to that. We would be speculating. Um, and then the the DA, there was, a, a, I guess, a, a document that was put up on the docket. And they've since put out a statement about this saying it was a test. They were testing the docket. It just so happened to have all the same crimes Donald Trump eventually was charged with on it. Um, maybe in the future, uh, if you're going to run a test, maybe have test crimes uh, on there uh, instead of the actual crimes, uh, because the right wing has run away with this saying, oh, it was preordained, uh, you know, this kind of dumb thing, but it was really just an administrative error. Uh, and so everybody freaked out for a minute there because we were all on the edge because we were all expecting this thing to come down to, to you know, on that day instead of the next day. Uh, and then um, Judge McBurney told reporters to go to dinner. Uh, I'm here for the long haul, basically, and left the court open. And once those doors stayed open past five, that that was the indication. The the we all sort of had a feeling, but that was the real the real indication that these uh, this indictment, I should say, was going to happen that day. Um, a staffer um, had his number, had Judge McBurney's number, in case he needed to call, get him, you know, back on the bench. Uh, and you know, this is different than how a federal indictment goes down. They don't file it under seal. They walk it over, you know, they put it, they file it, the clerk files it, then the clerk is marched in and hands it to the judge. The judge can, they have the option to read them or just sign them. And he just signed them and handed them back over. And then it took a few hours to docket the actual indictment. And then we all got it, I guess, sometime between 11 o'clock and midnight on the East Coast. Um, so that that's basically the day uh, leading up. Oh, and also during the day on Monday, while we were waiting, a judge had approved the use of cameras in all proceedings related to this indictment, which means, uh, you know, they turned on the live shot when the clerk walked in the indictments and he signed them. Uh, They will be able to have the arraignment televised. And we've been told that they're going to take a mug shot and his height and his weight for this arraignment. They're not going to treat him any differently down in Georgia. Uh, and the the whole trial will be televised. That's going to make it. That's that's a marked difference from the Department of Justice, unless, of course, 
the you know judicial commission and uh, chief judge John Roberts, chief justice John Roberts decide to allow this particular federal trial to be televised, but that makes it uh, very different from um, what uh, what the you know the indictment that we have by Jack Smith. But also, what makes it really different is the granular level of because. Jack Smith had to just indict Trump to keep it clean, to get it done by his, you know, they want to do this on January 2nd. They want to get this trial over and done with. Uh, and so I think that, you know, the looking at this RICO indictment, I mean, we've got, we'll go over the details, but we've got 19 uh, defendants, 30 co- unindicted co-conspirators. That's 49, that's almost 50 people. Uh, and all of their crimes. I mean, these are 41 counts uh, and it's it's very, very detailed. And that's because, you know, she's got the time. She's state, right? Nobody, you know, I I guess there's already a January 6th trial for Trump that's going to happen prior to the election. Uh, But she she went deep. She went detailed. Yeah, you know, and a couple of thoughts. One, it was kind of extraordinary last night to watch. You know, one, it it convinced me, you know, I was on the fence a little bit about whether or not, you know, my general sense was, yeah, we absolutely should have cameras in the courtroom. And it's certainly not, if not cameras, then electronic devices so that reporters can report live as uh, whatever is going on occurs. But then watching it yesterday and just seeing the diligence with which people... You know, the, the the clerks and the court staff brought in the indictments to the judge who went through it, who returned it to them to ask a, ask a question about it, whether it had been in their possession the whole time and whose possession it would return to and watching them deliver it to the actual clerk for filing. That is the sort of thing that I think, A, just in general – for the judicial process is very helpful for American people to have faith and confidence, particularly now that, you know, an entire half of the political spectrum appears to be attacking the judiciary and attacking the the good works of, you know, the well-functioning of the government. To have the ability to sit there and watch it is so instructive. It is so educational. It is so reassuring in terms of building faith and confidence in the process. Nobody watching that could allege shenanigans. I mean, it was very clear what was going on and it was very above board and you had all these witnesses and it was clear there wasn't, you know, a secret cabal of reptilian <laughs> government overlords who was doing this up all behind, you know, closed uh, doors. It's a good thing. I am hugely skeptical that John Roberts or anybody else is going to change course, notwithstanding the fact that this is the first time ever we will be charging a current or former president. I I hope till the end of hopes that it happens. I have little expectation that it will. And then turning, you know, your point to the scope of this thing, I, you know, and we'll get into the granular details after the break here, but it was the first time I think in any charging document we have seen the entire spectrum of what Trump allegedly did with regard to Georgia. And it is everything. It is sitting there and planning his activity. It is going after and in you know going after the 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 second fake slate of electors. It is going into the actual voting infrastructure and trying to take allegedly and and manipulate that data. You want voting fraud? There there allegedly is voting fraud in this document. And we'll get to it in a second. To all the statements and his pressure and calls to people, his trying to highlight that on social media you get the entire breadth of this activity. So it's not some narrow thing. It's just the, it, it, it's astounding. And it's just Georgia, right? I mean, there's some allusions mm-hmm. to, to Michigan, but this isn't everything that was going on in the United States. This is one state and just the sweeping breadth of all the alleged criminal activity that went into this with Trump at the top of it. It's, it is staggering, but it's also just hugely informative In terms of, you know, this wasn't some one-off thing. This was a complex, developed, over months, sort of series of events, all designed to illegally, allegedly, illegally keep Donald Trump in power. And so it's it's good to have it all in one, and and we're about to go uh, break it down here, right, in a little bit. Yeah. And uh, before we go to that break, I just want to tell you really quickly uh, the things that uh, Fonnie Willis said during her brief press conference. Um, She, you know, she announced uh, the indictment. She talked about racketeering. She talked about the criminal enterprise. She very importantly talked about the difference between an overt act and a predicate act uh, and said overt acts are not necessarily illegal, but are done in furtherance of the conspiracy. Uh, And predicate acts are the the crime. Those are the underlying crimes that that fit under the the RICO, the racketeering act umbrella. And, uh, the, you know, they sort of kind of like how the underlying crimes in the Manhattan DA case 
elevated the falsification of business records from misdemeanors to felonies. He doesn't have to prove those crimes. They don't have to be successful. They just have to have been there uh, as, you know, kind of the motive, I guess, sort of sort of like what was making them do this. Somebody, made, uh, I think it was Tim Heafy, put out a great example. He's like, look, if I'm part of a uh, uh, the mafia and we're going to put a hit out on a guy and two of the guys go out and buy some rope and a hammer from Home Depot, uh, that's it's not against the law to buy a, hope, a rope and a hammer from Home Depot. But it is if you're on your way to kill a guy. That's a, it, It's an overt act toward the conspiracy, toward the completion of the conspiracy. And so now, of course, all the right wing guys are like, oh, look, it's illegal to do this according to. I can't no, even talk a, to my friends. No. Yeah. yeah. That's not what that is. And, and of course, it's very similar to his, you know, documents, uh, defense, you know, type type of a, hey, I, there's nothing wrong with me as a president having these documents. It's just it's all, all absolute BS. Uh, and then something else she brought up, somebody asked her, um, you know, hey, there, we understand for RICO, there are five year mandatory minimum jail sentences. Can those be served with probation? She's like, nope, they got to be done in prison, in jail. So nobody can get probation on this. And that's going to make a lot of people flip, I think. Um, you know, her her last major RICO case with those school administrators who were cheating on tests, she started with 35 defendants and ended up taking 12 to trial because they were all like, I don't want to go spend five Mando years in in jail for this guy or for, you know, the person at the top of this at the top of this conspiracy. Yeah, and it's interesting because there there are a couple of uh, Atlanta based Georgia attorneys who said that isn't the way the law is written that there is the possibility of probation. But I mean, she was absolutely unequivocal that no, there's a, there's a five year mandatory minimum. So it's going to be interesting to me because you know these again were legit you know folks, legit prosecutors and and defense attorneys down in the uh, Atlanta area. So. You know, she clearly knows this area of the law. She clearly has worked this uh, area of the law a lot. But it does go like, I mean, I, you know, you and I were talking about this last night as these things were unfolding that like the best in many cases, the best source of news is going to be the local news. And like whether it's the Atlanta Journal Constitution or others, they not only have some of the better source base, because again, they're not swooping down into Atlanta to cover a trial. They're there every single day developing sources in the bar, in the courthouse or wherever it may be. But they've also got the expertise of the past coverage to be able to say what, you know, is routine, what is standard, what is not. So, you know, as you, as you select, as you sort of, uh, cultivate and, uh, curate your news sources, huge pitch for local, uh, local news sources. Um, but it, again, she, she was, you're absolutely right. Absolute 100% certain five-year minimum. Uh, and I think there will be, I would be surprised and, you know, we can talk about this later too. But another thing she said is her preference was, to try all of these people together, like all 19 defendants, not separate mm -hmm. them out, but to do it, that's huge. That is complicated. That is, you know, I don't even know like how the, the logistics and, you know, if you listen to like Rachel Maddow's Ultra, you know, the idea of just 19 defendants, each with their defense teams, all in one courtroom, all objecting one over the other. I don't, it, it, that it sounds great to try them all at once, but the logistics of doing that uh, would be challenging. But the point, and saying all that, one of the points is I would be very surprised if by the time this goes to trial, there are still mm -hmm. 19 defendants. I think there will be a significant number of them who will choose to cut a deal. Um, you know, many of them probably right now considering whether or not, you know, they can – what a good deal looks like and, you know, reaching out to I'm sure the DA's office right now to sort of like start – you know, floating trial balloons of what a, a plea or, or some sort of uh, agreement might look like. Well, anything less than five years in the slammer is a better deal than you're gonna, <laughs> than you're yeah. facing because she she only has to prove two predicate acts in order to get these convictions, and she's got 161, uh, 34 or 34 of them are predicate, uh, and we'll go over that there in a second. But also, these are part the you can't pardon and get pardons on these. Not even first of all, you can't fed, you know a president can't pardon state crimes, but the governor can't pardon. They have a pardon board. And even the pardon board won't even listen to your application for a pardon until you've served five years of a sentence. So <laughs> unless their deal, I mean, they're, you know, the K, my, I would be going in being like, if I'm Terwilliger, Mark Meadows' attorney, I'm like, how can I get fewer than five years? Anything under five years? You got anything under five years? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about Meadows too. But uh, very um, detailed, long, thorough, granular um, 
indictment, uh, and it will be televised. So I'm looking forward to that. All right, we got to take a quick break. We'll talk about the indictment when we come back. Stick around. All right, welcome back. More patrons to thank. We've got Dr. Anne in St. Paul. Queen is life. My arm tat says so. Catherine Martin, Lynn Lyon, Aaron E. Bull, Wally Borgeson, J.P. Halverson, Lisa Galt, Tamara McKnight, Gigi, and the Giuliani Brain Trust. And with that, <laughs> let's let's turn to the indictment. Get down into the nitty gritty. So, this is an indictment out of Fulton Superior Court. There are 19 defendants, starting with Donald John Trump, but including Rudy Giuliani, John Eastman, Mark Meadows, Kenneth Cheesebro, Jeffrey Clark, Jenna Ellis, Ray Smith, Robert Cheeley, Michael Roman, David Schaefer, Sean Still, Stephen Lee, Harrison Floyd. Trevian Cudi, Sydney Catherine Powell, Kathleen Latham, Scott Hall, Misty Hampton. And I guess Misty goes by the AKA Emily Misty Hayes. But so those are the 19. And when you look at those 19, they are charged with a variety of 41, count them, <laughs> whatever that is, like two generations plus one or, you know, <laughs> two, two score and one. Anyway, 41 counts, in, including Rico solicitation of violation of oath by a public officer, false statements and writings, conspiracy to commit false statements and writings, impersonating a public officer, conspiracy to impersonate a public officer, forgery, conspiracy to commit forgery, filing false documents, conspiring or conspiracy to file false documents, influencing witnesses, conspiracy to commit election fraud, conspiracy to commit computer theft, conspiracy to commit computer trespass, conspiracy to commit computer invasion of privacy, conspiracy to defraud the state, and finally, perjury. Included Ooh. in addition to those 19 defendants, as you mentioned earlier, there are 30 unindicted co-conspirators, and all of this over the span of 98 pages lists 100 and 61 overt acts. And I think by Allison, you counted them up looking like 34 predicate acts. And so one note of all those people during that same press conference we were talking about earlier, Fonnie Willis said all 19 of those folks have until noon, a week from Friday on August 25th to voluntarily turn themselves in. So, you know, I have seen nothing out of the courthouse today indicating that any of them have so far turned themselves in. So the clock's a ticking and they don't, I don't think they're going to let them turn themselves in over the weekend, or if they do, they would probably be uh, remanded into custody until they could uh, make an appearance on Monday <laughs> But, uh, you know, time's time's a time's a wasting and we're, yeah. you know, eight days away. And they all have they all have arrest warrants out for them already. Uh, but she's given them until the 25th. So that's cool. There's an arrest warrant out for Donald Trump right now. Um, and she also, I believe, said she wanted a trial in the next six months. I, I don't know, remember if I mentioned that, but I thought that was a little. Um, uh, Quick. Optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> optimistic um but you know uh, who knows how fast these these you know this bag of rats will start turning on each other um and again uh before i go into this really well organized indictment by the way she lists the defendants and then on the right the charges are listed by number and then each defendant has numbers under their name corresponding to the charges that they're charged with uh, Trump has 13 counts here, so he's up to 91 felony charges <laughs> against him. Uh, and I think he'll, I think he'll go ton up, Pete. I think he'll hit 100. Uh, we just have to have a few superseding indictments here and there, maybe some wire fraud, I don't know, something in Arizona. We, uh, it could be, could be anything. But he's he's only nine away uh, from from hitting 100. So I think we, I think the chances are good. Uh, so first of all, she gives a little brief introduction, and it's awesome. She's like, Trump lost, and then he he also lost in Georgia, and then he tried to seize power and hold on to it and not lose. And then she talks about uh, the manner and means, uh, which and this includes eight schemes. And you you briefly mentioned them at the top of the show, Pete. First, there's false statements to and solicitation of state legislators, right? These are the hearings with state lawmakers where they lied about voter fraud and tried to get them to appoint fraudulent electors. And then there's false statements to and solicitation of high-ranking state officials. 
Uh, That's when they lied to the governor and the secretary of state, speaker of the house, and tried to get them to violate their oaths of office. And they also did it, they mention, in Arizona, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Uh, And then there's creation and distribution of fraudulent elector certificates. And they mentioned that they did that in six other states as well. And there's uh, harassment and intimidation of Ruby Freeman. And I'm really glad that, that this is in here. We talked a bit about it, that, the, that these charges may, may come up. And that's the Harrison Floyd and Trevion Cootie uh, meeting with her, trying to get her to sit with Ruby Freeman, trying to get her to admit to committing voter fraud. Uh, they went to her house, knocked on her door, talked to her neighbors, like just a whole like rotten intimidation right down to the on the ground not just you know Rudy sh- you know shouting this stuff into the ether or or Trump tweeting about it they they had people go to her house and meet her and try to intimidate her and then we have solicitation of high ranking department of justice officials and that's when they tried to get the department of justice to that's when Clark went to Rosen and Donahue the acting attorney general and acting uh, deputy attorney general and tried to get them to sign off on his letter to Georgia saying we found some election corruption. And they even used the example where Trump told Rosen, hey, just say the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the congressional Republicans. Then we have solicitation of the vice president, which we know that's the uh, Pence pressure campaign. Then we have breach of election equipment in Georgia and elsewhere. And then we have obstructive acts, finally, is the eighth thing. And that's filing false documents, making false statements, and perjury. Uh, And then, you know, I had mentioned that in her press conference, Fonnie Willis made a very clear point about the difference between an overt act, which isn't necessarily illegal, and a predicate act, which is under, you know, falls under the RICO umbrella. And I went through, she did this chronologically. She didn't separate them out by predicate and overt. So some of them are predicate, um, all of them are overt, and some of them are also predicate. And I went through and I counted, there are 34 uh, predicate acts. Um, And this spans, Pete, from November 4th, when Trump made the speech declaring victory. Remember, Rudy was drunk and said, you should just say you're the winner. He wrote that speech with unindicted co-conspirator one before the election on Halloween, who, by the way, co-conspirator one, Tom Fitton. And uh, he ends shirt with too act- small, Tom. Right. <laughs> yeah, your shirt's not fitting. And then ends with uh, pre- uh, with Act One Sixty One, with Chile committing perjury before the grand jury in September of twenty twenty two, lying about stuff. So, I mean, there's so much in here, and I don't want to go over the elements of the details of the crimes because we know them all. We saw them all in the January sixth hearings. We've heard them all in public reporting. Uh, but I think it's important to point out the predicate acts here. Uh, so I don't, I, I don't know what it, what it, you read through this. I mean, there's so much detail here, Pete. Yeah, there is. I mean, a couple of things stood out. One is the, you know, particularly for me, and we, we talked about this a little bit on the bonus episode, the stuff in Coffee County, one, that's not Fulton County, right? So it's something outside, ordinarily outside of the jurisdiction of what would normally be handled in Fulton County, but because of RICO, it was brought in. So that's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, that those are all... They're computer crimes, the conspiracy to commit computer threat, theft and computer trespass and computer invasion of privacy. So you've got these these cyber uh, charges that are come into play with Coffee County. And the other thing is it references and it parallels other similar intrusions into voting infrastructure, separate and distinct from the the false elector slates, which DOJ, federal DOJ, is also looking at. This is talking about the actual intrusion, actual tampering. And so, you know, all this claims about, oh, you know, there, there are things you know, the votes have been tampered with. It's like, damn right, allegedly by Republicans in Coffee County, Georgia. So my question, you know, I've got a little bit of a, you know, some question given that, you know, there are a couple of folks in Michigan as well who have been charged uh, along the lines of the same sort of like intrusion or, you know, taking without authorization voting equipment and infrastructure, whether there is a broader federal case to be had, whether it's being investigated, because some of the same players, you know, and we'll talk about it, you know, our guesses as to who these folks are, um, you know, there's something there. And then, you know, the other, to your point, something this complex, I don't think she had any other choice than to lay it out chronologically. When you have something this complex, 
there's really no other way. If a viewer, if a reader is going to make sense of it, you've got to tell a story and you've got to tell a story in a chronological way is going to be the best way for people to understand, to try and sit there and do it partially chronologically, but then separate it out by overt act versus predicate act. It just gets too complicated to have people flipping back and forth in their head about, you know, okay, go back two months now and let's talk about the overt acts to achieve it. You can't, that just, it gets too unwieldy from a narrative perspective. So I think the way it reads, and I'd encourage everybody, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, we do we do know all of it, but again, what I took away reading it is, again, it was just stunning how much there was. This wasn't <laughs> just, you know, it wasn't just one little thing. It wasn't just, and we know this, but when you see it all together, it's like, oh yeah, you know, there was this group that went to Coffee County. And of course, yeah, I remember the the call with Raffensperger, but oh gosh, I had forgotten the thing about, you know, this with, with the, the conversation with with Eastman and you know the fact that Cindy Powell had almost been named a special counsel. All these, all these things, when you see it all together in a very, very coherent, easily approachable. I mean, this isn't legalese. You can read it as a non-attorney and get it. It's just a, a stunning and literally indictment of all the stuff that was going on by Trump and his camp. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I took away from it too. So I really encourage everybody to read it. I mean, I, we could go over the individual uh, acts here, but you, you might as well just read it. And that would take, oh, probably four hours. So what I want to do is I want to tell you really quickly about the acts of racketeering. Um, and the these are the predicate acts. There's 34 of them. You only need two. You only have to prove two to get the RICO indictment. Uh, and so we'll start out with the, the lies uh, that were told to the Georgia Senate and the House by Rudy Giuliani, Ray Smith, and Cheeley when they lied to the members during hearings. And those hearings took place on December 3rd, December 10th, and December 30th of 2020. And that's just all the, you know, 6,240 dead voters and 400,000 elite, you know, whatever their BS was that they had no proof of. Those are cons those could lies. Those are lies. And that is a predicate act under RICO. Then we've got um, Schaefer, Still, Latham, and the fraudulent electors forging and mailing the fraudulent elector certificate. And there's a lot of charges surrounding that. There's falsifying, there's lying, there's forgery, there's mail. You're mailing it. You're trying, you're trying to act uh, as, a, as an officer when you're not by calling yourself a duly elected uh, elector. Uh, there's all impersonating, that's it, impersonating a government, government officer, all sorts of uh, crimes surrounding that. So that takes up a great deal of some of these acts there is that particular fraudulent elector scheme. Then we have the Lee Cootie Floyd um, group trying to intimidate uh, Ruby Freeman, and there's multiple charges here. They int intimidated her and they solicited her to lie and say that she had uh, taken part in election fraud over there at uh, the State Farm Arena. And they went to her home on December 15th, and then they met her in a police station on January 4th. She was so afraid she would only meet with these folks in a police station. And I, one of them is Kanye's publicist. So that's right. interesting, too. I, I think about if somebody flips here because they don't want to go to prison, they would have to give all the information on who directed them to intimidate Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. And that could be interesting. Uh, then we have uh, Clark, Jeffrey Clark, trying to get Rosen and Donahue to sign his Georgia letter. Then we have Trump and Eastman lying in that lawsuit that went out, the Georgia lawsuit, Kemp v. Trump, I believe, or Trump v. Kemp. That was December 31st with figures they knew to be false. And we have Eastman's emails saying, we know these are false. We shouldn't sign this lawsuit, but they signed it anyway. Right. And trying to find trying to find a notary where they're like, well, you know, <laughs> do we go to the UPS store? <laughs> like hey, everybody who's a notary went home. It's like, well, we need a notary now. Again, it, just the little details that, you know, have mm -hmm. been forgotten. But anyway. That's... Yep. Yep. Uh, then we have Hall, Latham, Hampton, and Powell, and five unindicted co-conspirators. This whole group are the are the ones who uh, executed the Coffee County burglary of the you know the Dominion voting machines. Then we have Trump's false letter to Raffensburger, false writing, right? That's a conspiracy to commit false writings to Raffensburger in September of 2021. He sent this in 2021, asking him to. Again, you know, turn over the hand over the election, declare it, you know, uh, whatever, and and you know, make him the president, or at least give the give the Georgia electors to him. He kept doing this well into twenty twenty one, 
Uh, then we have uh, Schaefer, uh, who's the ex-head of the GOP, lying to the district attorney about the fraudulent elector scheme in, a, in an interview with the district attorney's office, and then Latham and Sheely committing perjury uh, in front of the grand jury. So those are the those are the predicate acts. There's 161 of these overt and predicate acts, but those are just the predicate ones. Yeah. And again, you know, the nice thing is you go through, if you're listening to this, you know, pull up, if you don't already have it, pull up the uh, copy of the indictment, because it's really, it goes through and you can see in each act gives the date and you can kind of walk through on those predicate acts. You can kind of see what date it occurred, what the act, what the predicate act was and who was involved with it. So again, it's easy to, you know, as you're listening to this, pull that up and, you know, it'll help sort of like narrate as you follow along on there. It is, you know, one, one thought about, I am glad to see the charges uh, relating to Ruby Freeman, because this really gets the the federal indictment that Jack Smith talks a little bit about that, but this is really, you know, the harm that was done to her. And I, that's appropriate, I think, you know, for the state at the state level, that is the appropriate level. When somebody is being threatened in their home, that is the sort of violence, that is the sort of alleged criminal activity that's really appropriate for county level criminal indictments to handle. So I'm glad to see that expanded out a little bit. I think, uh, you know, one of the things that becomes very interesting to me is where you see overlaps between either indicted and or unindicted co-conspirators, you know, people like Sidney Powell, people like Clark, people like Eastman, they are now wrapped up both federally and at a state level. And you start gaming out, well, who's going to try and cooperate? You know, if, you know, do they gamble and say, well, I'm going to take my chances at the federal level because if Trump or Republicans get gets elected, I'm going to get a pardon, but I can't get a pardon in Georgia. So I want to cooperate there. It, it just gets the, the, and, you know, to do that, with, again, 19 moving pieces, take Trump off the table because he's not going to plead, I don't think, but 18 different moving pieces trying to figure out whether they make a deal. And certainly a big chunk of those facing criminal exposure at the federal level as well. And and how- mm -hmm. And not know, just those 18, the 30 unindicted co-conspirators doesn't mean all 30 are cooperating. They could also be trying to vie for some sort of a deal. Right. And as Jack Smith is indicating, you know, his, his investigation is continuing, whether it is looking at the fundraising, whether it is looking at the actions of co-conspirators one through six, where charges for them and or others may be coming there. You know, there's still a lot of moving pieces and like Mark Meadows, right? He is not, as best we can tell, one of the unnamed co-conspirators at the special counsel's D.C. indictment, but he he's a named, he's been indicted in Georgia. So, you know, what does that do to his motivation to make a deal? What does that do for Jack Smith if they want to call and use him as a witness? The fact that he's been indicted in the state of Georgia, is that something that Donald Trump or other people, you know, who, who ultimately are indicted in federal court in Washington, D.C.? Can they use Meadows' Georgia indictment to sort of undercut and try and impugn his credibility on the stand as a witness? It, it starts getting, you know, the, the sort of mechanics of everybody's motivation and who and why may cut a deal and where uh, starts getting really interesting. And like eh, almost every case, Everybody's not going to get a deal. First no. ones in the door usually have a much better chance of getting a deal. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, 18 cents of defense sets of defense attorneys at least are conferring <laughs> with their clients today trying to figure out, like, you know, what's our play. And these, these fools are clearly not the best at chess because they're here in this indictment. Uh, so, <laughs> um, you know, we often joke about, you know, thank God it's a stupid coup, you know. Because if this were handled or done or tried to be attempted by uh, actual intelligent people, we could be in a lot of trouble. But I am—I do wonder a lot about Meadows because if he ends up cooperating in the unpardonable five-year Mando minimum Georgia, that means he's got to cooperate with the feds. I mean, if you're testifying to you, you're not going to get immunity in federal court for things that you say in state court unless you cut that deal. Right. Uh, with both sides. So it's going to be very interesting to see how uh, all these folks um, react. But speaking of the uh, unindicted co-conspirators, I have some guesses here. Now, I'm going to go by number here. If you want to see these in, you know, in a list, I put them on my account on post dot news. I yeah. put the <laughs> follow me on Mueller. She wrote. And, and to highlight, these are our, your and my guesses. These have not been yes. alleged. This is not in any government docket. This is merely our best guess uh, mm -hmm. of, of who they might be. We're not saying they are. Yeah. 
And uh, unindicted co-conspirator one, I th- I'm pretty sure is Tom Fitton, yeah, could, unless I, somebody else helped him write the Election Day victory speech. No, I think that's right. I mean, there's stuff that's come out via FOIAs from uh, American Oversight and others that it's very clear that, you know, they have emails where Tom Fitton has sent in, uh, you know, a, a draft Election Day speech that lines up exactly with the date. So I agree with you on that. Yeah. Uh, number two is a fraudulent elector. Don't know which one. Number three could be maybe Boris Epstein. Unsure. Very unsure. Uh, number four, again, very unsure, somebody named Robert Sinners. He was a Trump campaign officer who helped with the fake elector scheme, but later denounced the big lie on Trump. So he kind of fits that description. But there could be so many people that do. He's just the one I've heard of. Uh, five and seven sound like Biggs and Gosar. Uh, but I would be surprised if there were any unindicted co-conspirators that were members of Congress, but they fit the bill there. Uh, a six, by the way, right in between there, sounds like Phil Waldron. Remember the ex-Army guy who got all up in the White House all the time and was talking with Eastman and Rudy about all this stuff, the fraudulent elector scheme and the Pence pressure campaign? Uh, eight is, I am pretty definite that it's Burt Jones, okay? And Burt Jones is the current lieutenant governor. Uh, he's the one Fonnie Willis had to recuse from prosecuting because she held a fundraiser or was yeah. part of a fundraiser for his opponent, which was not the s- smartest move, but she's recused. And by the way, this is brand new breaking news. I'm just getting this as I'm going through this, Pete. A special prosecutor has been appointed to investigate Burt Jones. So <laughs> <laughs> it could be 20 uh, defendants <laughs> here. So I was close with 17. I was pretty close with 17. But then we have uh, 9 through 19, which are fraudulent electors, and we don't know which is which. 20... Whoever 20 is was at that December 18th knockdown drag out Oval Office meeting where everybody was screaming and yelling at each other. Could be Byrne, Patrick Byrne, could be Mike Flynn. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, they both, I mean, they both are possible. I think it is one of them. They both have said they were there, I, I think. Uh, there was, according to Byrne, there was uh, another attorney by the name of Emily Newman, uh, who I think worked with Powell, Newman. who was in there. It it maybe is her, but my, my guess would be on Byrne or Flynn. I mean, there's been reporting that Flynn provided testimony to the grand jury. Certainly, all both of both Byrne and Flynn, Flynn was making statements, uh, you know, up on January 5th and, and all kinds of other statements about the about the election burn provided by, at least uh, according to reporting, national media reporting, was providing uh, aircraft and funding to send around these vote audit people to whether it was Antrim County in Michigan or Coffee County down in Georgia that, you know, Flynn and Lindell and others were doing that. But both Flynn and Byrne have said they were in that meeting. And through testimony, January 6th testimony, we know uh, that they're both there. Which one of them it is, don't know. Um, yeah, you got me. Uh, 21 and 22 could be Todd Sanders and Conan Hayes. They're two fellows who worked with the cyber ninjas post-election, went around doing all that BS. Uh, 23, I have, I have no idea. It's somebody that one of the three people who intimidated Ruby Freeman called, uh, Kanye. I really, I really have uh, no idea, but 23, I'm stumped. Uh, 24 through 29 are Coffee County burglary conspirators. And 30 is a lawyer that worked with Sidney Powell. Could be Emily Newman. I don't know. But uh, I, I, there are a you know, handful of attorneys that, that were in and out of there working with her. So could really be anybody there. Those are my guesses. Um, so take that all with a, with a huge uh, grain of salt, if you will. Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, it's like the the game of the day, much like co-conspirator one through six with the federal indictment from Smith. This is, you know, you turn on Twitter or go again. As discovery starts, as people turn themselves in and they start receiving, uh, you know, people receive discovery and the records of who these folks might be and statements they might have made. You know, I'd expect before trial, we'll have some more uh, more granularity about well, who- Well, Trump the, will intimidate them on truth right. social, and then, <laughs> then we'll know. Right, right. On his way to being remanded into custody down at uh, in Atlanta. So oh, we'll see. Got it. Um, all right. Uh, so we have to take another quick break. We do have more news, but uh, holy cow, this is a huge, huge indictment. Um, it's- so sprawling, so massive. And and before we go, um, I just want to point out that uh, Harry Littman uh, has just tweeted, former assistant deputy director of the Department of Justice, perhaps, I can't remember his yes, exact yeah. title, 
Um, he just tweeted that Mark Meadows is the first to move to remove the Fulton County criminal case to federal court. So Meadows has filed to move this to federal court. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if Trump does. I mean, he tried that in uh, New York and up in New York, they said, nope, you're not going to do it. It stays at the state level. But there was a difference there that a lot of those activities predated his uh, assuming the presidency. You know, there is because of these things starting before the end of the presidency, I think there's a much better argument that, you know, whether or not they were legitimate, whether or not they're allegedly breaking the law that in you could make the argument they do relate to his official duties as the president. So I would not be surprised to see uh, Trump make an attempt uh, to do that as well. And again, then the question becomes like how and. You know, just again, in terms of people who I read and trust, Joyce Vance, uh, a former U.S. Mm-hmm. attorney down in Birmingham, I think, wrote uh, a long piece uh, about this specific process, about, you know, what is involved and what it entails and what's eligible and what's not. But then the question is, okay, if you, if they are removed, I, you know, how does that, do the other 17 people stay at Fulton County? You know, if these are all, co- or if they're conspirators, how do you bring them up into the federal level? What are the equivalencies of you know, Kate, of, of laws, of federal law versus state law. You know, these are all, you know, this is stuff uh, beyond my expertise, but I would not be surprised at all to see Trump fairly quickly as to remove it and get, you know, roll the dice. And maybe he gets, uh, you know, a federal judge that he appointed, just like he got Eileen Cannon. Yeah. And also interesting, you know, trying to figure out whether Meadows is going to flip or if he's cooperating. Sounds like not so far. Uh, and he's going to probably do everything he can to delay and get this out of uh, state court and um, until maybe uh, it, it comes to the point where he has to. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see how it ends up working out here with, with Mark Meadows. But if he doesn't cooperate, he's pretty criminally exposed in a lot of this stuff. So, uh, uh, But he has a good lawyer. Terwilliger's not, not a you know cheese bag like, the, like a lot of these folks are. So we'll see what ends up happening. But I kind of have a feeling that I, I kind of always had the feeling that he was sort of cooperating, but not really to keep them off their back just, you know, long enough to not have to do stuff. He's pretty shrewd, that Terwilliger guy. So we'll see what we'll see what uh, shakes out. All right. We've got more news to get to. So uh, everybody stick around. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. Just a few more patrons to thank. We have Brett Howe, Gray Bear, Christina Old, Indigo Patricia, Karen Burns, Lisa Noble, Sarah Stevens, Lori Hainan, Blazer Quasar, Banana Fana for Fraser the Cat, Laura Reyna, and Zara. Again, patrons, thank you so much. Thank all of you for what you do to make this show possible. We just hugely appreciate uh, your patronage. And simply couldn't do this without you. You make this possible. And thank all of you for your support in uh, allowing us to bring this uh, out every week. So let's pivot now to uh, the FBI and kind of a, uh, you know, a, a very sobering event where FBI special agents shot and killed a Utah man last Wednesday while attempting to arrest him for allegedly making threats against President Joe Biden ahead of the president's trip to the state. FBI SWAT agents, according to media reports, were giving commands to the man when he pointed a gun at them, according to a law enforcement source familiar with the incident. The individual, Craig Robertson, was facing three federal charges, including threats against the president, as well as influencing, impeding, and retaliating against federal law enforcement officers by threat. Investigators noted that Robertson appeared to own, quote, a sniper rifle, unquote, and several other firearms. Uh, these were no like ordinary threats. One of them, all in caps, I hear Biden is coming to Utah, one threat read, according to prosecutors, digging out my old ghillie suit, which is a, you know, kind of camouflage suit to wear outside to, uh, you know, break up your your appearance in, in the woods or in outside, and cleaning the dust off the M24 sniper rifle. Welcome, buffoon in chief. In a post last Monday, Robertson said, quote, hey, FBI, you still monitoring my social media? Checking so I can be sure to have a loaded gun handy in case you drop by again. Oh, wow. Yeah. Robertson also allegedly made threats on Facebook against Attorney General Merrick Garland, including a picture of a semi-automatic handgun with the caption Merrick Garland eradication tool and a description of a dream about killing the attorney general. 
Other politicians who he allegedly made threats against included Vice President Kamala Harris, New York State Attorney General Letitia James, and California Governor Gavin Newsom. Hmm. That's, um, I haven't really read any updates on that, but um, it seems like the right wing uh, misinformation, disinformation machine are trying to say that he was assassinated. 75 year old man assassinated by the FBI. But, you know, if you make those threats and then you're facing charges on those threats and we come to get you and you point guns at us, um, that's it's good. Game over, man, as they say. In yeah, and, and not even close. And it doesn't matter if they're threats against President Biden, if they're threats about against President Trump or President Bush. I, I, I don't care. If you're making specific threats of violence that you get a visit from federal authorities and you refuse to talk to them and they come back with a SWAT team and instead of talking to them, you pull out a gun and point it at it. I, you know, we'll see. Uh, you know, as I mentioned during the bonus episode, every single time an FBI agent, you know, uses around, whether it's against a person, whether it's an accidental discharge, there's a very detailed inspection that occurs that goes through every last bit of detail about what happened. I'm sure there will be a thorough review of this. But, you know, again, just given the man's statements, given all the firearms that he both was known and claimed to possess, the very violent threats he was making online, I don't care if he's 12. I don't care if he's 32. I don't care if he's 92. If you engage in that sort of behavior that is threatening the president or otherwise threatening the community and law enforcement, you you know, and then law enforcement shows up to talk to you and you pull a gun on them and point it, you're going to have consequences. And yeah, Kathy Griffin got a, a visit, uh, had a visit uh, by Secret Service and the FBI uh, because of her, you know, the post that she made. Um, and, you know, now, of course, all the right wing media is like, why didn't she get assassinated or whatever? Well, which they showed up to her house. She invited him in, gave him a soda and told him she's a comedian. Uh, and then, you know, that, that wasn't a, an actual threat. Um, they, you know, but they went to see, they went to determine because that's what you do. Um, and she, you know, she won that first amendment case. She's a, she's a first amendment hero, but, um, that's exactly what you do, Pete. You get a threat like that or anything like that, you're going to get a call and you can't pull a gun when they show up to your door. All right. Uh, let's talk about this FBI whistleblower. Cause there's some, uh, let's just talk about him. This is from David Kirkpatrick at The New Yorker. Uh, Agent Jonathan Buma is this guy's name. He's a, a, of the Los Angeles office of the FBI. Holds a unique perspective, he says, on the origin of two interconnected political scandals. He's a former biochemist who was trained in Russian by the agency, and he has spent 15 years cultivating human sources in investigations of money laundering, public corruption, and foreign attempts to influence elections. In January of 2019, Information from one of Buma's sources, confidential human sources, set in motion the FBI's first inquiries into potential undisclosed lobbying and tax evasion by Hunter Biden. And at the time, a director of the Ukrainian company Burisma. OK, now Buma also played a pivotal role in a bureau investigation into possibly illegal foreign lobbying activity and campaign finance violations by Rudy Giuliani. Well, this April... Buma reached out to Jim Jordan, saying, hey, you're doing these hearings on the Hunter Biden stuff. Uh, let me offer you some public testimony as a whistleblower. He later gave a detailed phone interview to two former federal agents whom the committee had hired to investigate what its conservative members call the Biden family business. But he didn't tell Republicans what they wanted to hear, according to this Kirkpatrick piece in The New Yorker. He told them that during the Trump administration, they were all over investigating Hunter Biden while agency leaders moved to quash his investigation into Rudy Giuliani. But, Pete, Buma can only speculate about the motives behind the interference that he claims to have experienced once his investigation touched on Rudy Giuliani's ties to Russia and Ukraine. And his performance evaluations make it clear that he's got some flaws. Uh, he has a not very good attention span which is sometimes reflected in his paperwork. He may have violated agency rules, but uh, in seemingly minor ways, I guess, by being in contact with sources abroad without proper clearance. Or by using his personal car for government business, I guess, a few times. But the thing that stands out to me there is getting sources without proper clearance. Uh, he also got into a dispute with his supervisors about whether he had broken protocols about encrypted communication over personal electronic devices. So, interesting. Um, so few red flags here for this particular whistleblower. 
Um, what are some of the red flags you saw when you, I mean, it turned in like a 70 something page report. What did you notice? Yeah. And there are at least two reports floating around out there, right. That are not the same one. I, I've seen two. Uh, one is completely unredacted. It is addressed to the house weaponization committee. It has a great deal of information about all the horrible things that Hunter Biden allegedly did, but absolutely no detail at all about anything relating to Rudy Giuliani. And then there's a second version with some overlap and some redactions that does include the sort of, hey, we were, I was told to stand down or move away from anything re related to Rudy Giuliani. So it does appear that, you know, he, there's some tailoring of his messaging going on. There's some things in there that strike me a little bit. Like early on, he, he calls himself a senior special agent and capitalizes the S in senior. There, there's no such thing in the FBI, you know, to try and make that into a title. You can be a senior special agent, but you're you're a special agent, right? I, and and so to try and make that into you know a, a title that it's not, you know, is this puffery to try and get the you know? And there are other things he said, you know, he's designated a subject matter expert or a SME and SME, you know, for something that he was you know, one of the, you know, top 10 counterintelligence agents and one of the few people who spoke Russian. I mean, look, I, I you know, I, I haven't, I haven't heard of this guy before. I, I know many of what I would consider the Bureau's, uh, you know, top Russian counterintelligence agents. Uh, you know, could he you have do. suddenly- You know Russian suddenly, counterintelligence su 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 agents? Suddenly, <laughs> might he have become one since, uh, you know, 2018 and, and hit that top 10? Possibly, but I just, and look, there, there, there are, a, you know, there are not a ton of Russian speakers, but there are more than two, right? So this, uh, sort of the things he's saying strike me a little bit as uh, exaggerations. I, and I just, I, there's something just reading through it that gives me real hesitancy about uh, about wanting to hear more about him, about his background, you know, what led him down the path. At some point, you know, there's a uh, a... a, 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 a a unit that reviews source reporting and the sources and the relationships. And he's alleging that he was told to shut down a source. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Like why he was told to do that. You know, he feels that he was on the trail of something big and they were trying to quash it. Well, maybe, but it also could be that there was a real problem um, with the source of sources. And so there's a lot there that as I read it, it makes me uneasy, and and I don't. That's kind of why that that little sort of throwaway line about not authorizing getting your sources authorized like really stood out to me. Yeah, and I just I I want to wait and see. I want to wait and get a little more information. It doesn't strike me, you know, some of the things like we'll we'll see what you know when the when some of the FBI whistleblowers went in front of the Weaponization Committee and like the night before trial in response to a request from the committee the FBI said oh yeah here's the background information on them and like you know several had their clearances revoked and you know here's all this you know sort of derogatory information i i didn't get the sense that that's the sort of problem it was more you know the the two IRS whistleblowers who truly you know my opinion again maybe believed what they were feeling but kind of lacked necessary maybe the the higher level picture or maybe we're a little too close. That's what this guy, again, you know, my opinion strikes me as the kind of guy who went down a rabbit hole with some theories or some sources and got a little too close to his cork board with all the pictures and the yarn drawing a spider web of connections that more than was healthy. Uh, and, and again, that's not based on much more than a gut sense, but I just, before I go attributing too much to this source and his, or there was whistleblower and his allegations. I, I just, I want to know a little more. Yeah. Same, same Z's investigation. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. Can we get Chief Justice John Roberts to televise me talking to him? Maybe can we? <laughs> yeah. No, no. Do you have, do you have a yacht to provide vacations? Maybe. Short of that. I no. Could I Tom could Sam. take him on a f fishing trip. Like, at you know, the <laughs> trout farm down the street, yeah. but that's yeah, we're walking. We're walking halfway across the bridge. Here's a can of worms that somehow, <laughs> somehow, I would, I, I like prefer it among the common man in my RV. <laughs> I'll bait your hook for you, yeah. John. Uh, all right, um, we <laughs> we have a couple more fun announcements, uh, but we're going to take one last quick break. Everybody, stick around. We'll be right back. Everybody, welcome back. Again, thanks so much to patrons. We've thanked you all, by the way. I just wanted to let you know, if you want to become a patron, you can do that by going to uh, patreon.com slash aisle45pod. That's A-I-S-L-E-4-5-P-O-D. I realize I didn't say that the whole show. 
I was just having too much uh, too much fun with Rico, Rico Suave. Uh, but uh, anyway, thank you again for being patrons. We really appreciate you and, and uh, all that you do to help us keep putting this show out week after week. This is going to be your ground zero for all things Fulton County. So that's, this is, consider that. Somebody was like, are you going to start a Fonny Willis, she wrote? I'm like, no, I, I don't need a fourth show. We'll just, we'll just make, we'll just focus on it on, on cleanup on aisle 45 because that's what it is. We're cleaning up aisle 45 with these RICO charges. Um, some other uh, fun little cleanup elements here. Uh, Pete Navarro. Uh, he tried to delay his September 5th the, contempt trial. The world's trial. angriest white man. <laughs> I don't know, man. He's up there for sure. Uh, but he, yeah, he he would he was like, I don't even know what his reasons were. You know, this probably something dumb, something of Fifth Amendment rights or something. You know, if I go to trial, then I that violates my Eighth Amendment right. He would he, whatever it is. Uh, was uh, not good enough to convince the judge. And uh, that trial, Pete Navarro's contempt trial, starts September 5th. Uh, I'm pretty sure since Bannon got to stay out of jail pending his appeal, they probably, since they're similarly situated, will probably grant that request to Pete Navarro when he makes it as well, because it would be very, actually, probably have a good case to say, hey, Bannon's out awaiting appeal. Why am I not? Exact same crime, exact same thing. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens there. But uh, these are misdemeanors, you know, a couple months. Um, I think it's a one month Mando. But uh, anyway, some, something else happened, though. We got another denial. Yes, yes, we did. Judge Merchan up in New York, having considered uh, the request by Donald Trump and his attorneys, refuses to recuse in the Manhattan District Attorney's case, said he had examined, laid out the standard for recusal and said, nope, I am very confident, uh, you know, having examined my conscience that I can administer, administer this trial fairly and without favor. And uh, nope, your, your, your motion petition, whatever the, the, the mechanism was, is denied. So we will have uh, Judge Merchan presiding over the uh, Alvin Bragg's case. So Whenever that happens to go down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, which be... may, I wouldn't be surprised to see that shift right. Yeah, appropriately so, in my opinion. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I think the things I would like to see first um, are certainly uh, the Jack Smith DC indictment and Fulton County. Um, and I think those, mm -hmm. you know, are obviously the two on the fast track. I have no faith in Judge Cannon to get anything to trial before September of 2029 or so, but we'll, we'll see how that unfolds in Florida. Yeah, it's going to be musical dockets. Um, there's going to be a lot of judges talking to judges, trying to figure out when to schedule trials. And Trump has a history of trying to use those trials and judges against one another to delay them both or all. Uh, well, why don't we just do it in 2025? Then we don't have to worry. Um, I, I can totally see that happening. So it's going to be it's going to be fascinating to watch them try to schedule all of these criminal and or civil trials you know, but I'm with you. And I think I think everyone's probably going to give deference to the Jack Smith DC trial. Uh, he has requested January 2nd for a trial date. Uh, Judge Chutkin will be making the decision on when to schedule the trial uh, on August 28th. And he has been attacking the judge and attacking Jack Smith. Uh, and she told him, the more you make inflammatory posts, the faster this is going to go, buddy. So I think she, every time he does that, I think that she might be more inclined to grant the January 2nd trial date uh, for the Department of Justice. I, I, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if the Department of Justice came in and after he files for his date, came in and asked for a faster one uh, based on some of these inflammatory posts. But yeah, maybe not. They, they tend to, Jack Smith is kind of like, We'll just let the courts do this and I'll just put my best foot forward and I'm not going to make any bail conditions. I'm not going to do any gag orders. I'm not going to do any, you know, any of just a basic protective order, which was granted. So we'll see what happens there. But um, I, it's going to be interesting to see them try to schedule these trials next year. Uh, and then also um, what was funny uh, to me about the Judge Merchan when he wanted uh, Trump wanted him to recuse himself, one of the reasons... I mean, I was joking about Pete Navarro's reasons to delay his trial, but one of the actual reasons Donald Trump said that, that he should recuse himself is because he has donated $35 to Democratic causes. <laughs> That's actually one of the things. <laughs> well, I, right. And I'm sure Eileen Cannon's participation and presence within the Federalist Society, none of that, none of that. You know, if you're going to have, here's the thing. 
If you're going to have issues and concerns about the objectivity, then like make that consistent. And it's quite clear due to the absolute silence when it comes to the judge that he's appointed that this is nothing other than a, you know, a politically motivated gambit that shouldn't have worked and it didn't work. So it's good. And my, as my uh, co-host on The Daily Beans, Dana Goldberg, so astutely pointed out, $35. This judge donated $35 to Democratic causes. Trump himself has donated more than $35 to Democratic causes over the history of his life. So, um, I, you know, just ridiculous. So, yeah, he's he, he'll be the judge. So I'm, I'm very happy to hear about that. And I think you mentioned earlier he tried to move it out of into federal court and that got that got denied as well. So that's happening. We just don't know when. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but we do know. Trials. Well, we- What we do know, as we're taping right now, it is well after close of business on Tuesday the 15th. So that means in Atlanta, Georgia, there remain seven and a half days until noon on Friday, seven and a half working days for 19 defendants to appear or be arrested. So, you know, keep your eyes peeled and we'll see and watch all those folks start trickling into the courthouse. Yeah, good times or flipping. We'll see. Uh, all right. This has been a, a wonderful show. Sorry we went a little bit over time, but the, the indictment was so huge. We just had to talk about uh, talk about it as much as we could. We'll continue to talk about that and break it down as things happen and things change. So thank you so much. Again, thanks to our patrons as well. And thank you for listening. Uh, we will see you next week. I've been Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Struck. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joel Reeder and Moxie Design Studios, and our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media.